I wasn't coming to exploit the continent. Mm -hmm. I was coming to learn and really inspire others to learn, right. to say there's there's a wealth here that no other uh, ethnicity can get. No other, they can't, they can come here and try to learn and, and do all of those different things. But when you descend from here right. and you can actually tap into to your, uh, your heritage and your culture and the, the various cultures that we come from, it's not Absolutely. just one, yeah, yeah. you can tap into that. Again, I will, it gave me a confidence that the U.S. couldn't have given me. Boom. What's up, guys? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Joannis or Joe Hatagua. I'm a Sierra Leonean American now living in West Africa. Right now, I'm in Zanzibar, Tanzania. And if you want to know why someone would be bringing 600 people in two years to Africa, then this is the video for you. Okay, cool. So today it's a little unconventional. Usually I'm sitting down talking to the camera, but I wanted you guys to see the view here and the beach that we're at here in Zanzibar, Tanzania. So I'm here with Maximum Impact and the CEO and founder of Maximum Impact is Jay Cameron. He's a playwright, he's a content creator, he's a speaker, he's a serial entrepreneur, and he's brought over 600 people to the continent of Africa. He's visited 23 countries and he's planning to visit all 54 before it's all said and done. He has excursions to all parts of Africa and black parts of European countries. So you can learn a little bit more about who you are, where you come from, and the connections between those countries and the motherland. And so today we're going to talk to Jay about his experience coming to the continent, why he built this business. And he's also going to tell us a little bit more about yourselves, HBCUs. I mean, we get deep, we get into everything. So let's get right into it. All right, guys, I am here in Tanzania with the man himself, Jay Cameron. I'm here with the man himself, authentic African. That's right, that's right. <laughs> Jay's the CEO of Maximum Impact. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the business and, of course, why we're here in Tanzania. But I always like to start with a little bit of uh, a background. Well, first of all, I'm here in Tanzania because of Jay and Maximum Impact. And um, you're going to hear all about this, tri this trip and see all of the content and the footage from this trip. But first, we're going to have a conversation with the man who put together this company, the reason why we are on this trip. So what I like to do is a little, is a little bit of a background. Let, let people know where you're from, who you are. Okay. Let's just start with where you where you were born and where you were raised. All right, I was born in Charleston, South Carolina. I'm okay. proud proud Gullah Geechee. Okay, um, Gullah Geechee. I was born there, but I was raised in Washington, D.C., actually okay. in the city. Uh, I was affectionately known as the DMV. I was raised in the D. I live in the M. Okay. Uh, but I really live all over the continent now. And uh, so that is the, the quick uh, backdrop. But I grew up in, in D.C. in the 80s. Okay. Didn't have a lot of exposure to international cultures even though I grew up in a very culturally diverse area right. a lot of people from Central America uh, India Pakistan places like that but I didn't actually have international travel experience one because of financial constraints yes so um, it, and it wasn't a priority growing up you know I, I did go to very uh, culturally diverse schools I went to Georgetown Day School for elementary and middle okay. school then I moved back to South Carolina for two years and I went to South Carolina uh, Dorchester County District 2 public okay. schools and then I came back and went to Washington DC public schools and um, so that's where I graduated from high school uh, and then just travel was never really important to me right you know right. I, was, I was just trying to figure out life always been they, they called me a serial entrepreneur that's what I heard sold watermelons out of the back of U-Haul trucks I've sold okay. everything sold cars owned car dealerships Okay. Um, been a radio announcer, just done a lot over the years. Sure. And so all of it, I realized, it was a culmination of experiences that uh, I needed to have in order to bring me to this point with maximum impact. So here we are uh, okay. on the continent of Africa. Awesome. So um, you answered a lot of the questions I was going to ask. So my next question is just, when did you first make the trip to the continent of Africa and where did you go? Well, I, I made it in 2018. So that's five years ago. And five years ago. What happened was that I realized that I'd gone my entire life yeah. and had not visited the continent. Right. I'd been, and I was afraid to venture out of my little geographical area, the I-95 corridor, yeah. might go down to Florida, might hop on a cruise to go to the islands or something right. like that. Right. But going to Africa always seemed like it was this daunting task. Yep. I was gonna have to get all of these shots to go. I was gonna have to go through all of these hoops to get here. And, uh, and I just decided 
that I didn't want to, I didn't want to leave this earth and not have this experience. Okay. But I didn't know what the experience was because I heard so many negative things over the years. Yep. Don't go, you're gonna get kidnapped, you're gonna get your organ snatched, you're gonna get this happening, oh, yeah. you're gonna get scammed, you're gonna go through all of this. Yep. So I decided to just push back against all of that and go to Ghana. So Ghana was my first trip. Okay. Changed my whole life. I started understanding the context of my life sure. and why certain things were the way they were in America mm. because of my experience and what I learned in Ghana. Right. And, uh, and so from there, I decided to continue exploring. I came here on my second trip to Tanzania, okay. climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. Okay. And I think Mount Kilimanjaro was the pivotal point in my life because I never climbed a major mountain before. Sure. Um, and But I knew I needed to do something different and nobody else was going to do it for me. Right. So I came. And I also knew that other people needed to see it. Yes. Once I went to Ghana, I said, I know a whole bunch of us, black Americans, African Americans, whatever they're labeling us as, right. that don't know and we're believing these narratives yep. uh, without understanding the different aspects. You know, some of what they tell us is true, sure. but a lot of it is not true, right. or it's one-sided, or it's missing information. Uh, they try to portray it as though we're so different, but we have so many things in common right. and really dealt with the same entities, the same mm -hmm. things that we complain about in America yes. is the same, the same entities that control and manipulate the narratives here on the continent. So I, I started educating myself and learning more and I said, I have a responsibility at this point yes. to share with others and let them see for themselves. Don't take my word for it. Yep. Don't just watch a documentary or just watch, come on and see. Yep. And when that happened, my first tour was in 2019. Okay, 2019. I had 35 people. Okay, 35 people. 35 people. So let's, cause, okay, because that's a lot of people for your first tour. Right. Many people who do tours for years mm -hmm. don't even reach 35 people. Yeah. So how did, how did you get 35 people to come on that first tour? To Ghana. Well, I already had an audience because uh, I also failed to mention I'm a playwright as well. So in being a playwright, I uh, hundreds of thousands of people had come to see my productions. Sure. So I had a large mailing list. Okay. But then I also produced this video called The Ghana Chronicles. Okay. And it talked about my experience in Ghana. Mm -hmm. And that went viral. Okay. And then we had uh, other people who, you know, were on the mailing list, they were like, well, if Jay's doing it, there must be something to it. Right. They ha shared the same feelings that I had, and they said, you know what, I want to go. Okay. And, and that's that's how that audience came about. Uh, we did 35 people in um, November 2019. Okay. Then guess what happened six months later? The global sickness, as they call it. There you go, the global sickness, that's what we call it. That's, that's good for... The algorithm. Yeah, good for the algorithm. Yeah, I got okay. you. So, so that happened. <laughs> sure. Um, but it shut down everything. Okay. I never yeah. anticipated. I knew I was going to bring people back, but sure. I never anticipated that maximum impact travel would become what it, it has become. Right. So when the world was shut down, I kept coming back to the continent, and the first place I came back to was Tanzania. Okay. I was here. So that was 2020. That was 2020. Okay. Okay, so the name Maximum Impact, how did you come up with the name? I mean, it's obviously an impactful name, no pun intended. Um, but wh where did the name come from and, and why did you name it Maximum Impact? You know, that's a good question because even to this day, I'm still trying to figure out what inspired it. I wanted to have something that was different. Okay. And I guess when, it, when you think about it, I wanted to have the maximum impact with anything that we did, sure. whether it's through travel, whether it's through our children's books, whether it's through our uh, online academy, whatever it is, I said, we want to have maximum impact. And again, I had no idea that we would be bringing hundreds of people back to the continent. Right. So right. it started at 35. Now here we are at hundreds of people coming every year and it's like a maximum impact and so the name just kind of i guess it was the right name for what we do so i was going to ask you i mean so we talked a little bit about the the name of the business you mentioned hundreds of people how many people i know we talked about this offline but was it over 600 people over 600 in, and you, you so your first trip was 2019 right pandemic shut it down for basically about a year right a year and a half actually. a year and a half so we're talking about really in about two and a half years, right? In about two years. In about two, two years, years. 600 people yeah. have gone on these trips. That's right. Okay, and you obviously are having a maximum impact, right? The people, it's, a, it's an impact in terms of the scale and the number of people who have gone on the trips, 
but the quality of the trip itself. And the people, the, the, the impact that it has on people's lives. Right, right, yeah. That, that's what I look for when, when I see, we've had people travel with us four times. Wow, okay. Within that time frame, we had one couple travel with, with us three times in one year. Wow. We had wow. a grandmother in her 80s come with us last November, mm -hmm. turn around and brought her grandson back this summer. So, so there's something special happening. And I tell people all the time, I say, it's not, we're not just doing trips. Right. We're creating a family atmosphere, one where people connect with one another, right. laugh, have a great time. They want to see each other again. Um, and then other travel companies see what we're doing. Right and they recognize that it's something different. They don't want to necessarily deal with the hassle of, you know, coming to Africa. Right. So we've already laid the groundwork, so we partner with a lot of different companies and, and that's what we found works well. So it's families, individuals, as well as other companies and, and that's what we're doing and it's, um, and it's working really well. Nice, so obviously you've mentioned Ghana already. We are in Tanzania right now. Um, what countries have you been going to, are you going, and are you going to currently now? Oh, wow, okay. We go to Nigeria, we go to Cote d'Ivoire, we go to Togo, we go to Benin, we go to Egypt. Uh, we have Ethiopia coming online, we have South Africa. We also have uh, Kenya, Seychelles. We, I'm um, going up the coast, Senegal, the Gambia. We have Brazil, uh, we have Cuba. So I'm just going, um, we're adding uh, Costa Rica, Panama, and Colombia. We do our uh, Black London and Paris. Mm -hmm. We're adding Black Spain, Portugal, and we're doing Black Amsterdam. Uh, we are in talks now with Suriname and, and bringing that connection between Suriname and Amsterdam okay. as well. We do in the States, the Gullah Geechee connection. Okay. I got, got to represent my folks down. So, so that's what we have going on. And um, looking for 35 destinations uh, by the time we're done uh, to connect or reconnect the African diaspora. That's really dope. And, and how many countries have you been to yourself personally on the continent? 23. 23. I've been to 23. Out of the 54. That's right, 23 out of 54, 43 total. And I'm um, looking forward to getting the all 54 at some point. Yeah. But I wanna make sure that uh, as we're bridging the gap, that's our theme, we bridge the gap between Africa and the African diaspora, that we are educating at the same time. Yep. Uh, but, but people have a great time, you know? So it's not like you're sitting there with a book you know, on the trip, it's like you kind of see, I just let people see for themselves and, yeah. and it all kind of clicks as it happens. So you've, you've mentioned a couple of places where I think is interesting. You mentioned Black Amsterdam, you mentioned Black London. How do you, how do you decide where you go? Um, yeah, how do you decide on, on the countries you go to and what kind of research do you do beforehand before you start bringing trips there? Oh, I do extensive research, one, yep. uh, to understand the history and how it ties into the African diaspora. Because most of us, when we hear London, we're thinking Buckingham Palace, right. we're thinking Big Ben, we're thinking Kensington Palace, we're thinking queens and monarchies and all of that. And then we think Paris, we think Eiffel Tower. Right. Without even knowing the history of the Eiffel Tower. So that's, right. that's a whole nother story. Right. So what I do, I recognize, I look for the African diaspora, those who have been dispersed throughout the world who descend from the continent of Africa. Where are we the most popular? So I look at Brazil. Brazil has the largest population of Africans or people of African descent outside of the continent of Africa. So, but, but how many of us know that? We're, m many of us think, okay, black Americans. Right. But it's like, no, we're not. You know, mm -hmm. so it's like, wait a minute. So I went to Salvador in the state of Bahia in Brazil and I saw all of these beautiful black people. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, what, what's going on here? Right. So I started looking for places like that. And then as I did an extensive study on colonization, right. I started realizing, ah, oh, if I listen to the language that the people speak, mm -hmm. I know who the colonizer was. Yes. So yes. I said, ah, so they speak Dutch in Suriname and Aruba and places like that. Right. But I didn't understand right. the Dutch, the Afrikaans and, and how their influence down in South Africa. Right. So my mind started really looking at that and saying, I go to a place like Togo or Cote d'Ivoire. Right. They're speaking French. Mm -hmm. Why are these black people speaking French? Well, because the French were there. Yep. Why when I, uh, you go to French Guyana, the people are speaking French, that's in South America. Yeah, exactly. Or in Haiti, yep. they're speaking French. Now, a, a lot of them have held onto their indigenous languages, sure. but it just makes you stop and wonder. So I look for that because I know that if we can start connecting the dots, we'll understand what really happened. Right. Because when we think about education, everyone says you gotta get educated, but we're, we're using a European system mm -hmm. as the standard. Yep. So that's a form of white supremacy when you think about it. 100%. So, you know, I'm like, well, yeah. you know, you're like, well, yes, you're educated if you have this degree here. Well, who, this is what really started hitting me. Who founded 
many of our HBCUs. And who are they named after? I never even thought about that. Yeah, I know, it, it, it starts getting deep. Mm -hmm. You know, you start, you're like, well, yeah. wait a minute. Now, wait yeah. a minute. You mean to tell me Howard's not named after a brother? Mm. Nah, nah, Howard's not named after a brother. Mm. And we wear the names and, the, and, uh, yeah. and I'm not throwing shade on anybody. I'm just saying these are things that when you start waking up and you're like. You just need to know it. You just need to know. Spellman, yeah. was, was, was Rockefeller, you know, all these different connections. And right. I'm wearing this. So what they did was masterful. They imposed their language. Mm -hmm. They imposed their names. And I'm talking about the colonizers and no, the imperialists. Right. And so without me understanding it, I'm now proudly walking around with someone's name, yep. and I don't even understand what other names I might have connected to me. Right. And, and so when I started doing that, I said, wow. So when you start shedding this light, people start digging. Yep. And you know, we're smart people, we're not dummies. You right. know, that's one thing I know about the African diaspora, we're not dummies anywhere. Right. It's just that when someone has manipulated the education system, manipulated the culture, manipulated so many of the religious systems and all of that, we begin to think like how they think. Right and don't even challenge it until someone puts something in front of us. It's like, hmm, consider this. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's impactful. I mean, just so many things in there. I don't walk down. Yeah, you, you, I, I want to bring it back to this sure. conversation because you mentioned Gullah Geechee. Yes. And as someone who is now living in Sierra Leone. Yes. Um, and I've met many Gullah Geechee folks. Um, and the funny thing is I used to watch this TV show on Nickelodeon called the Gullah Gullah Island. Yes. Right? And I was not aware of the connection until about a year ago, which is kind of crazy. But to tie that into your personal story, now you've, you did your African ancestry. I did. And you found out that you are from an indigenous tribe of Sierra Leone. Can we talk about what that experience was like and, and you getting your citizenship yeah. in Sierra Leone? It was really funny because I sat down and, uh, and I did the reveal. Yeah. for African ancestry with Dr. Gina Page okay. at her office. Okay. And she said, well, uh, and it was my mother's line. Okay. So the, the way it works is it, it picks one particular line. Okay. It's not a cumulative result, it's like one line. And that one line, my mother's 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 mother's, only the women, okay. no men, mm -hmm. went back to Sierra Leone and intimidate people. I didn't know anything about Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about Timonay people. And I just and this is before I took my first trip to Ghana. Right. I was like, okay, Sierra Leone, that makes sense. And so as she explained it to me in the video, she said, now the rice farmers. And I said, well, I was born in Charleston, South Carolina. Right. It's like, well, Freetown, Sierra Leone, and Charleston, uh, South Carolina have adopted each other as sister cities. Right. And so if anybody knows anything about the Gullah Geechee, rice farmers. Yep. I said, well, this makes perfect sense because I was born there and this connection. So this was in 2018. Okay. Fast forward 2021. Uh, I just happened to glance on my Facebook and I saw where Sierra Leone was offering citizenship to anyone who descended uh, from or could prove that they descended from Sierra Leone by way of African ancestry. Right. The only way that it could be done was by way of African ancestry. Right. I immediately signed up uh, to go and I went and I got my dual citizenship in Sierra Leone. But by that time, I'd begun learning more and more about the culture and the right. history, the Timonay, the Mende, the Creole, all the different cultures and what was happening in Sierra Leone and Liberia and, and how that whole region even came about. Sure. Uh, and, and so it, th then it just caused me to, at that point uh, to, one, get the dual citizenship, but then I wanted to learn more about right. West Africa yep. because I knew even when I took some of the other ancestry tests, they offered um, a more comprehensive approach, sure. you know, to or, or comprehensive understanding of my genetic background. So I knew that there was a lot of Nigeria, Ghana, and Sierra Leone. Now, on my, I, here, I did another African ancestry test for my father's mother's line so okay. my aunt she did it okay and i went back to the mafa people in cameroon okay so i was just in cameroon cameroon currently does not offer dual citizenship right but it's just fascinating when you start diving into this because uh many of us from the african diaspora in the u.s yeah. we don't know you know people mock us well what tribe do you come from right, but he, right. you don't know where you come from and mm -hmm. all of that and the others say, well we're finding out how about exactly. that and okay. and there's certain advantages that we have because we can claim the u.s because that's where we were born. Yep. But we can also claim Africa because that's where we descend from. Yep. And when we are able to proudly do both and not have to pick a side, yep. there's a power that comes with that. So I, I want to try to get the timeline of 
when you got your citizenship and maximum impact had you already started doing trips to ghana and yeah. so okay yes i did actually 2021 was when i got my dual citizenship in sierra leone right 2019 okay. is when i did my first uh trip now okay but i'd only done one okay i got my citizenship in uh sierra leone in uh april of 2021 okay i started my first series of trips at, uh, during covid okay. in june of 2021 okay okay so the timing was perfect, perfect yeah because now there was a level of um just confidence that i had right. coming in and credibility because now you know i have the citizenship and then uh and people could see that there was something different i wasn't coming to exploit the continent mm -hmm. i was coming to learn and really inspire others to learn right. to say there's there's a wealth here that no other uh, ethnicity can get no other they can't they can come here and try to learn and and do all of those different things but when you descend from here right. and you can actually tap into to your uh your heritage and your culture and the, the various cultures that we come from it's not Absolutely. just one yeah, yeah you can tap into that again i will it gave me a confidence that the U.S. couldn't have given me. I agree, 100%. Okay, so we, we talked a lot about the background. We talked a little bit about the business in terms of where you've gone. Um, we talked about the number of people who've come. But what I'm, what I'm interested in is the age groups and the types of people who come on these trips. So um, you and I had a conversation off camera. Yes. And I was fascinated by the, uh, the scope of age that you have of people coming on these trips. So can we talk about that a little bit? Who's, who are the typical people who come on these trips? Well, each group is unique. Okay. So I never know who's coming. Right. But I've had people, uh, I've had at least five people in their 90s. In their 90s? 90s. Getting around, That's that shocked me. Right. Um, 80s, lots of people in their 80s. Right. Lots of people in their 70s, 60s, 50s, 40s, uh, every age group. So right. the youngest age is three. Okay. So from age three to 93 has wow. been the range. Okay. Uh, the majority of people have been over the age of 40. Okay. And the reason why, well, economically, sure. you know, just thinking about it from that standpoint. And then they have an understanding of this continent. Sure. You know, when you have an education system in America that's trying to erase everything African or they're trying to paint a negative narrative. Right. Like when we were growing up, people weren't excited to go to Africa. So, I wasn't excited to be African. Right, 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 exactly. Growing exactly. Up, it's yeah. like, yeah, well, yeah. You know, your name is different and all these yeah. other kind of things. Yeah. So when you see uh, there were so many, because one thing I talk about is like, don't live this life and miss out on coming to this continent. Right. And right. when you hear our elders say, you know what, I'm going, I'm going. They have the resource to do it, but they bring their families along. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the, those in the middle age, maybe 40 plus, they'll bring their parents, but they'll also bring their children. Right. Because it's a responsibility that we recognize that we have. Right. That is, if, if certainly the American education system or the, the Brazilian education system or the, the education system in the UK or France, they're not going to prioritize educating a whole a group of people they've been able to exploit for hundreds of years. Right, exactly. So if we exactly. take our economic power that we have in the U.S., and I'll just use us, with the $1.6 trillion of spending and economic power yep. that we have, which would make us the 13th or 14th wealthiest country in the world, yep. if we take that and we say, hey, we're going to go and invest in our families and our communities and educate ourselves right. and stop putting the European education standard as superior yes. and saying that, no, we can go get this information now. The Internet is here. We don't have any excuse, but not just the Internet, but we have the resources and the means to go. Yep. It's when you understand that power. Right. So here we are. We're learning to do better. Yep. And, and I just recognize. Yep. Within those age ranges, mm -hmm. you know, the, I had a 93-year-old man tell me, Mr. Freddie Taylor Sr., he came okay. and he said, he said, I'm 93 years old and I'm still learning. He said, thank you, Jay. There I've had 85-year-olds, I've had 70, some, like 70, the age, the men between the ages of 73 and 80. Mm -hmm. In particular, they pay a lot of attention. Then I think about the children who are coming because the parents right. are willing to bring them. Right. And what they're not, what the things that they're not uh, forced to absorb right. because they've seen for themselves. They come to Zanzibar and breathe the air or they go to Egypt or they go to uh, to the Serengeti or they go to Ghana or they go to South Africa or somewhere and and their whole life changes. So That's huge. Uh, and so I, I mean, I'm thinking about all the people that you've impacted. And, you know, it's, it's the 600 plus the people who they've gone back to talk to, yes. right? Um, and what happens is people get really excited and want to start businesses. Oh, yeah. On the continent. Oh, wow. Right? Um, and as someone who's been coming back and forth to the continent for about seven years, twice a year, um, I've had conversations with many folks who want to start businesses on the continent. And as you 
as a person who's done business in many different countries, you partnered with people. I'd love to ask you, what are some of the challenges starting a business and building a business on the continent of Africa? The biggest challenge I would say is for someone not knowing what they're getting themselves into. Okay. So they're coming in with an American mind or a UK mind sure. or a Caribbean mind and they're yeah. expecting the business system to be the same way. Right. So the first thing, I, the learning curve was me, I had to understand, oh, they don't do it the way we do it in America. The regulations aren't the same, and you, if you don't understand how they play ball here, they'll take advantage of you, and they really don't care. Right. You know, so you gotta find your leverage point. So I had to find my leverage point, and, and I had to understand the language that they spoke and what they needed. So what we do is we make it a win-win. So if we went through all the transportation companies, just had a situation recently, transportation company sent us a vehicle that wasn't what we requested. Right. Uh, and so we had to learn the hard way how to navigate that situation. So sometimes you'll make money, sometimes you'll lose money. Mm. I call it experience tuition. Uh -huh. uh, so you have to be willing to, to endure that. Uh, but if you're not willing to, if you're just coming over thinking you're just gonna make millions of dollars because you show up and you're <laughs> you're who you are. You're you. Oh yeah, you're you. Oh no, right. you're gonna get your heart broken. And okay. uh, so, so that's the deal. And then understanding that some places are not necessarily friendly mm -hmm. towards foreign in investors. Yeah. So you have yep. to now figure out, okay, how can I, I how can I navigate this? Right. Who can I bring to teach? Uh, not teach, but who can I bring along that I can employ mm -hmm. that maybe can do some paperwork for me that, right. that I've established a relationship with and we can build this the right way and I make it equitable for them so I help elevate their standard of living. And, and so it's all kind of strategies, different places. And, you, and, and it's always a new surprise around the corner. That's, that's important to know. I think, I think people just think that they can come here, as you said, like you're you, and you just come here and just start a business. Um, now, you've, you've had businesses in the US, you've had businesses here, um, you know, and you've discovered the challenges. What kind of advice would you give to someone who's looking to build any kind of business? And, mm -hmm. and I say Africa, obviously the, the continent is vastly different in many different regions, 54 countries. Don't kill me because I said Africa. I'm only saying that because he's been to 23 countries, <laughs> right? So he actually is someone who's been to more countries than most people on the continent, more presidents on the continent of Africa. So that's why I say Africa in general. But um, from your experience, right, what, what kind of advice would you give to someone who's looking to come to the continent and start a business? Well, be patient. Be patient with the process and do your due diligence. Okay. Be willing to put the upfront investment and spend time in the region. Before I do a, my first tour anywhere, I've been to that location at least three times. Okay. Um, I establish relationships on the ground and I show people that I'm trustworthy. Mm -hmm. And then there are other, again, I've had to not, I've had to stop working with a lot of people because they just saw me as money bags. Sure. And I couldn't get into my feelings about it. I said, okay, I get it. You know, everybody's out here trying to make ends meet. Right. But if you spend time on the ground and you're patient with the process, then the money will come because people will see your focus and they'll say, okay, this person knows what they're doing. Right. And, and you can create a pathway for someone so they don't have to go through the same learning curve or the same challenges that you went through. Right. But if you just come and think, oh, well, I'm just gonna try to do a, a tour company or I'm gonna try to do a shipping company or whatever company online, yeah. and not come, you're gonna lose a lot of money. I promise you, mm -hmm. you're, you're gonna, and you're gonna cry and you're gonna then turn around and say negative things about the continent. Yep. Uh, and it's really your fault right. because you did not come and do what you were supposed to do. That's like people who fail in business in America. Right. You're thinking, I'm just going to open a business and be, people are going to come because because of that. Right. No, the hours that we put in, the care, we do it with a labor of love. Right. Uh, we are, we do expect to get paid for what we do. I have, I'm unapologetic about that, but we deliver. And that's the whole point of it. If you come in, whether you want to open a restaurant, I say restaurants are big. Right. If you come in and you do a restaurant and you have great food and great customer service, you're going to win most places on the continent of there you Africa. Go. There you go. Uh, and, but you got to be willing to put the time in. You have to be willing to put the money up. Mm -hmm. And if you're not willing to do that, now it's going to cost you less than what it would cost you in the U.S. You know, a solid restaurant in the U.S. might cost you, just depending on what type of restaurant it is, at least $300,000 right. uh, to get up and running. If you put three hundred thousand dollars into a restaurant anywhere in West Africa, <laughs> right, you're doing good if you do if you deliver it the right way, Absolutely. and you don't and you don't have to put that much to get started. But if you're not willing to put the, the do the homework, yeah, get to know the culture, get to know who you have to take care of. <laughs> I'm saying that the right way. Yeah, exactly. who you have to take care of along the way. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, if you take care of the right people, the right people will take care of you and you can build a very prosperous business. That's why you see so many Europeans over here. Yep. You see so many Middle Easterners here, so many Asians here, uh, because they understand the wealth that's on the continent. We're the ones who are afraid to come. We're afraid of the visa process. We're afraid of all these things that somebody else said who's yeah. afraid. That was really impactful. Maximum impact. <laughs> I'd love to talk all day. We got a band sitting yeah, right next ready. to us. And they're they're like, ready. Get, ready to get started. They're ready to rock and roll. Uh, they're ready to get, yeah, they're like, get ready. Um, so I guess the last question I have from you is where can people find Maximum Impact online? Okay, just if you type in at Maximum Impact Travel uh, on IG, YouTube, or if you just type in my name uh, at J Cameron Official, you can find uh, us there or MaximumImpactTravel.com. We have an online academy coming, so that's where we're going to be. It's a comprehensive universal family academy. Okay. So nice. from all ages, from the, our babies all the way up to our elders. Okay. So that's on the way. You can also, if you want to check out my children's books uh, on the adventures of Darren and Destiny, they travel all throughout the African diaspora. So we have animations coming uh, with them. We have a live production coming. So so many things are happening with Maximum Impact. You you can definitely follow us and share what we're doing and become a part of the Maximum Impact Travel family. And you'll have all of your info and links and everything that you can share. Absolutely, in the description below. Um, and of course, you know, I'm doing a trip coming up sometime in the near future, so check that out in the description below. Also, um, I'll have links to other things that you can find out more about different trips that Jay's doing um, in the description. I wanna thank you again for doing this. Um, this is the third to last day. T tomorrow's a free day, and then the day after that we is travel. A travel. Yeah, so it's, it's like it's kind of third to last day. Yeah, kind of. I guess day. third to last day. Yeah. yeah, we are we are wrapping up the trip. It's been an amazing trip so far, and I'm glad we got a chance to sit down and talk. Uh, with that, guys, thanks you for watching, and thank you for doing this. Thank we'll you, see you guys. All in the next video. Okay, cool. So that was the interview with Jay Cameron. Now, as you can see, we started in, uh, at right before sunset. The sunset and it was dark by the time we were finished, but it was a really important conversation to have. We were on our way out. It was a, there was a band about to play on the stage right here. I wanted to do this intro and this outro right next to where the stage was. It was an important conversation. I got a lot from it. And the conversation afterwards, I wish you guys could have heard it, but at least you got this conversation. So if you want more from Jay, his information is gonna be in the description below. Of course, if you want more content like this, you have to subscribe. If you know anybody planning to come to the continent of Africa, share this video with them and then look through the description below. I got links for all of the different excursions that you can go on. I have my own page for the Tanzania trip and then there are many other trips. So make sure you check it out. Um, and with that guys, thanks for watching. See you all in the next video. All right guys, if you like this video, go ahead and hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, like, comment, and share it with your friends. All right, see you on the next video.